All right, hi everyone. So we're going to continue the course. Uh, we're gonna switch gears completely. Uh, so the next section will be on social engineering. Um, social engineering is something we've seen, uh, we've talked a bit about it in the context of attacks on HTTPS. Uh, but in this case, we're going to do a deeper dive. Uh, so this will kind of span two lectures. We'll go through the kind of the background material and the theory of it. And then um, I'll tell you lots of stories about examples uh, from real life examples of, of social engineering. Okay, so social engineering, if we want to put a definition on it, uh, you can think of it as trying to gain access uh, to something. Um, it might be information, like something digital. It might be something physical, like access to a specific room. Um, so, so we're being very general uh, when, we, when we talk about access. And uh, specifically, in order, one, one way to get access would be to go through a human. So there's a human and their job or for, for whatever reason they find themselves in this position, they're, they're the ones that are going to screen access and say, yes, you, you have access. No, you do not have access. Okay, and sometimes this is explicit, like it's part of their job. They know that they're doing it. Sometimes it's more implicit, like it's sort of in the background. You don't really think of it as your day-to-day -day job, but you have the power to override certain things and that would ultimately allow people to have access even though you don't really necessarily think about it in those terms, okay? So for example, um, maybe you work in key control at a, a corporation, like say Concordia, right? And so um, you, uh, you know, implicitly have the ability to grant people access to certain rooms or not, depending on what key you cut uh, for, for, for that person, but you're not necessarily thinking about what those rooms are and what's inside those rooms and things like that. That's actually, that's maybe more explicit of an example. Um, implicit would be like like even, more kind of in the background like uh, maybe maybe you have the ability to reset someone's password uh, but you're not thinking about all the things that are attached to that password like like when that person has that password then they can send an email uh, and the email will look like it comes from them and then that email could ask key control to give them access to a room because they lost their key or to get a backup key or something like that and so like all of this kind of traces back to the idea that that you reset their password even though you're not really thinking about it as something that that you know you're, you're not thinking through the the whole attack so so think of a tree attack tree and there's lots of branches leading up uh, to the attack anyways social engineering is 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 a very prevalent uh, vector of attack today. Um, so it sometimes it's the entire attack, sometimes it's just a piece of the attack, but uh, attackers have sort of woken up to the idea that sometimes it's a lot easier to just get on the phone with someone and, and try and, you know, maybe pretend to be someone that works there and, and get access that way rather than doing some sophisticated technical hack uh, of, of the company. So uh, social engineering, it's, it's very prevalent. And, um, you know, one time I went to a bank and the people at the bank said, you know, we have, um, I don't know, like a couple hundred people that work on security on the infrastructure side. We have about two people who kind of deal with social engineering, although it's not like a well-defined role. It's just sort of something that, that happens to come across, you know, in, in the job that they do. And you know, but 90, 95% of the attacks that we see are social engineering attacks, someone trying to reset a bank password or get access or, or calling up and claiming to be someone that they're not, right? And, and only 5% are attempts, you know, at the networking level to breach the server or, or attack the infrastructure or that type of thing. Um, so anyway, so the idea is that social engineering is sort of disproportionately used compared to how well you know, how many people a corporation will hire uh, in order to prevent it. And then from an academic perspective, right, if there's so much social engineering attacks, why don't we have courses on social engineering? So it's, it's this sort of thing that it's harder to study. It's harder to write an exam question about social engineering. Um, and so it tends to not get very well coverage from within academia, even though it, 
you know, even though it's it's maybe the most prevalent uh, attack vector today. So, anyways, that's that's why it's in this course is uh, we're we're trying to cover maybe some of the things that fall through the cracks of of the other traditional security uh, subjects that you would study, like network security, operating system security, crypto, uh, that type of thing. Okay, now this is a methodologies class. Okay, so we would like to know, okay, what's the methodology for determining, let's say you're a company, you wanna decide whether you're vulnerable to social engineering or not. Uh, so what's the methodology that you use? Okay, and the answer, unfortunately for this course is that there is no methodology. So the theory of social engineering is sort of way behind uh, you know, its prevalence. And so at the end, I'll, I'll suggest a few methodologies that, that might be interesting to look at. Um, but we're still going to study it from a methodological perspective in the sense that we're going to think about what does it mean to be secure? And we're going to do the sort of the background work. So before you start applying methodologies, I've, I've emphasized this many times in the course, you, you need to understand what you're analyzing before you, you actually do the security analysis of it. So uh, for social engineering, it's going to be less about the methodologies, but more about just that, that sort of general understanding. And we're still going to apply frameworks and we're going to try and break the problem down and we're going to try and ca categorize uh, the kinds of things that we see. We're going to look for patterns. So we're going to do a lot of the things that we do in methodology, even though it's not explicitly like it doesn't have a name like evaluation framework or uh, attack tree or um, stride or, or whatever. OK, so that that will be the focus. Uh, social engineering is also interesting uh, because now it's becoming you know, you can get a job like basically being a penetration tester, but but you do it from more of a social engineering perspective. Um, a lot of hacker conferences have like social engineering challenges and things like that. And so it's, um, the, you know, the industry, even even though they may be lagged, uh, they are waking up to the idea that this is important and you need expertise within your company or your firm uh, in order in this issue. Um, another thing I'll emphasize is that uh, Ethical issues, so eth ethics means sort of what's right and what's wrong, and legal issues are, are also important. So a lot of the attacks that we'll look at, just like Heartbleed, we, we mentioned that, you know, this was an attack, it was a technical attack, and somebody got criminally charged, you know, for, for, for trying to see whether Revenue Canada was vulnerable to this attack or not. So social engineering is the same idea, okay? So a lot of the attacks and things that we'll talk about uh, in, in the coming uh you know, in the coming lecture will be, um, some of them will be illegal uh, for you to do. So these, these are done by black hat hackers. Uh, and sometimes they might be legally legal strictly, but there, there are some ethical issues that you have to think about, especially if you're one of the white hats, meaning the, the people who work for the company, you're just trying to test your own organization. You don't want to go around getting people fired and, and, and things like that. And so um, you, you have to think through the ethics. Okay, so here's some just quick examples, uh, just so that we sort of get a flavor of what we're talking about. So one example that we saw already is uh, when we were talking about certificate issuing uh, for HTTPS. This example actually had to do with code signing certificates, but it's the same idea. You, you get a certificate and there's a chain that chains back to some root certificate that's in your computer. In this case, it's for knowing whether a software update actually comes from the, the manufacturer of the software, as opposed to knowing whether you have a secure tunnel between your website and, and a company's, or a, a, like the website that you're trying to visit. Um, and so what happened in this case is there was someone who used to work at Microsoft uh, they still had some credentials, like maybe a, a, an employee card or things like that. They, they basically they had enough so that when they went to the certificate authority, and my understanding is this might have been an in-person interaction or, or at least on the phone or something like that. Um, they were credentialed enough, and they 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 told enough of a good story uh, that the certificate authority believed that they they actually worked at Microsoft. Uh, and so then they issued them a certificate as if it, you know, they they gave them the certificate that that included their own uh, private key uh, that corresponded to the public key in the certificate, and uh, it, they they gave it to them. Okay, uh, another thing that I, I mentioned already as as a sort of example is is like you might want access to a server room so that you can do a technical attack once you're in the server room. So you have physical access to the computer. It's going to turn into a technical attack at that point, but you need access first. Uh, and so one way you might do it is, is 
you might, you know, for example, if the company outsources their IT to someone else, you might figure out, okay, who's that company? You might put on the uniform of that company or, or something that looks like it. You know, you'll, you'll walk in looking like a sort of IT person where you have, I don't know, like a toolbox or tools around your belt or whatever that, that would typically look like something that an IT person would have. And then you're going to impersonate them. You're going to tell them, oh, I'm, I'm from this company. I need access for, for whatever reason. And then, and then you're going to hope that you get through. Okay. And IT isn't the only thing. It could be, you know, janitor staff, like cleaning staff, that type of thing. And basically anyone that might have access to that room for any reason, uh, that, that's a vector that you could use. Okay. And usually, I guess sometimes they might have credentials already, so they don't have to ask someone. But I'm envisioning a corporation where it's set up like there's a sort of desk uh, that, that you would have to go to and ask someone to, to let you into the room. Another example uh, are, are called road apples. Um, so road apples are, uh, well, it's an attack anyway that, that involves a USB stick. So that's what the picture is. Uh, so a USB stick um, is a dangerous thing to plug into your computer. Uh, it, and it used to be more dangerous. I mean, operating systems are sort of uh, waking up to the fact that this is dangerous. But um, in order to, to make them work um, like in a plug and play fashion, uh, what would happen is, is that your operating system might start executing code that's on the USB stick. OK, and sometimes even if the operating system is not going to do this or it's going to ask user permission before it does it, uh, there might be an exploit or something like that in the in the operating system that, that could get around it. OK, so if you plug in one of these USB drives into your computer, there's there's the chance uh, that that software starts executing and that software could be malware. OK, and so what people would do, the social engineering aspect is, OK, you, you need someone to run one of these USB drives. Uh, so you would go to a corporation, you would just sprinkle them around the, the parking lot, like maybe drop. Uh, five or ten of them around the parking lot, and your hope is that somebody comes and they uh, plug it into their computer. They find it. They're like, I don't know. This it's probably one of my friends or someone that works at the company. Maybe if I plug it in, there'll be, you know, some a document with their name on it or something like that, and I have a chance of returning it to the right person, right? So they'll just carry it into the corporation. They'll plug it into a computer, uh, and then the malware will it will infect the computer. So. An example of road apples that's, uh, um, I, it, it's partially speculation, like no one I don't think knows for sure, but, but this is the sort of the going theory, um, is there was, there was a very high profile nation state attack. So this is like governments doing espionage against other governments and operations. And so this one concerned Iran, uh, who were, they had like a nuclear facility. They claimed it was for energy. Uh, other countries thought that they were uh, using it to manufacture uh, nuclear weapons. And two of those countries happened to be the United States and Israel. And so they had this joint operation where they uh, were going to infect the computers that were running the reactor with malware. And the malware was called Stuxnet. And it became a very famous piece of, of malware once it was discovered. Uh, and it would basically make subtle changes to how the reactor would work. And uh, those subtle changes uh, would, would cause the reactor to break down, but the monitoring tools that you would use to monitor the, the reactor would, would basically display information that would be consistent with the idea that it was operating correctly. Um, and so they were able to sabotage uh, this, this reactor just using malware, essentially. Um, the problem is that the reactor was air gapped. So air gapping, meaning that the computers were not connected to the internet, they weren't connected to a network. So the only way that you could get malware on these in, the, in this network would be to, um, to physically access, get physical access uh, to the servers. And so no one knows, I, I don't know if people know exactly how Stuxnet itself worked, but the understanding is that there were a couple pieces of malware that were installed first that just sort of gathered information about what was running and then Stuxnet was tailor-made for for the information that they were getting from this this predecessor malware um i think i think it was called flame I, I the details slips my mind at the moment but um but but anyways that original piece of malware was thought that it was carried across using an attack something like this it was on a usb stick uh and somebody brought it in from the outside and they, they weren't an attacker. They weren't 
they weren't trying to break the system. Uh, they weren't a double agent or anything like that. They just, they just, it was just human error. Uh, they plugged it in and it had this sophisticated piece of malware because it was developed by a nation state. It exploited all sorts of things in the operating system that, that no one even knew about, even the manufacturers of, of, of the operating systems. So anyway, so that's an example of, of this road Apple attack. Um, so yeah, so sorry, I, I have a little uh, news article here uh, that, that describes the connection uh, between them. And then the quote is, uh, the primary functionality of Stuxnet Resource 207 module was distributing the infection from one machine to another using removable USB drives and exploiting vulnerabilities in Windows kernel to obtain escalation of privilege within the system. Okay, another thing is uh, sometimes with companies, you can actually call them. Um, so, so, you know, think of a bank or something like that. So you can get on the phone and they have no idea who they're talking to, right? There's no authentication on, on phone lines and you can spoof phone numbers and things like that. And, uh, and so they're going to ask you some authentication questions, but at the end of the day, they're, they're, they're questions that, that somebody might know the answer to, even though they aren't the actual person themselves. And you can also try and be very persuasive. The, the attacker that's that's calling uh, in, you know, they can manufacture some emergency situation where they really need the access or they can tell some sort of story about why they don't have the answers to the authentication questions and things like that. Um, and so this is something that's tightened. Security is tightened around this a lot. Um, but, but, you know, 10, 20 years ago, it was it was a lot easier. Uh, people were more believing of, of the people that called. Uh, and so this was a was a, a major attack vector, but it still exists today. Uh, another way of spreading malware is through emails. Uh, so you could have malware in an attachment in a file. Um, you know, the, the file could actually be just executable code. Usually most email clients aren't going to be OK with you downloading that. Um, but it could be in some sort of passive file like a PDF, which normally you display. But PDFs are very, they're very powerful. Like they're, they're capable of, of running script and executing code. And there, there could always be vulnerabilities in the reader of the PDF. And there, there are known vulnerabilities, right? So if you're, if I know that this organization is a little bit behind in which version of Adobe Reader they're using, right? And I know that there's some vulnerability that was discovered in the latest, you know, two or three versions, uh, then I might craft malware that specifically targets a version that's two or three things old. And a lot of times it's hard in a company because you have hundreds of computers and to upgrade them all at the same time, every time new software comes out without breaking things, you know, it, it, it's a whole task in and of itself. So anyway, so, so, so malware, uh, in an attachment, uh, is, is one way of, of spreading it. Um, you might also link to a website if you can get them to click on it. Maybe there's a problem again in the browser, the specific version of the browser they're using or something like that. And so far, this isn't really social engineering. Um, the social engineering aspect is how do I get you to click on that email? How do I get you to click on downloading that attachment? And so what I want to do is I want to disguise it as an email that sort of entices you or... Um, sometimes I might impersonate someone in your business. So like I get emails that are supposedly from our dean or our director uh, and they're asking for help. And ultimately they want you to like give them money by buying like a gift card and sending them a code or something like that. Um, so it's, it's a scam, uh, but, but that's where the social engineering part comes in. Okay, now where social engineering, you know, you know, we all see these emails probably. I mean, if you have a, an email address that's listed on the web, you auto, you basically automatically start getting spam and lots of, you know, phishing emails and, and, and those kinds of things. And a lot of them, like, don't look very well, okay? Uh, so so you can quickly determine that, oh, this is a scam and, and, and you won't fall for it. But there's a specific subset of phishing called sphere phishing where the person really has identified you as the person that's screening access to the resource they want to, to reflect back on the definition of social engineering. So they're targeting you specifically and they've done research on you and they know where you work. They know who your bosses are. They know who the other people you email with frequently are. 
they know what you like, they like they, they know what you post on social media, whatever, right? And so they're going to craft an email and that email is specifically for you. It's going to be spoof, so it's going to look like it came from one of your colleagues. Uh, it might entice you based on your interests. It might just be disguised as a kind of business email, like like here's here's my student's thesis proposal, like like uh, can you can you look it over or whatever? And, and it's exactly the kind of email that you would expect from exactly that kind of person. And those are a lot more difficult, uh, especially if you go through your email very quickly to, to ident identify as being uh, phishing emails. Okay, so like one uh, noticeable change that happened, you know, for example, not just within Concordia, I see it in almost all emails because uh, it gets kind of reflected back in, in the replies to emails. But a lot of organizations now will start labeling emails with a uh, warning like this email comes from outside of, of your corporation. Uh, and that really happened in response to people impersonating people like, for example, someone impersonating the dean of engineering, but they send it from, say, a Gmail account. OK. And and so that warning is a, is a, it's a very easy thing for software to pick up on, right? And it just says that oh this this is not coming from a Concordia account. And then if you're thinking oh is this actually the dean or not? Well, he's going to use his Concordia account to send the email, right? And so so that's the idea. Now the problem is you you get it on you know I get it on fifty percent of the emails because most emails come from outside of Concordia, and so I stop kind of paying attention to it and I've I've fatigued. To that warning and and so now it's like i, I don't even really see it um and so anyway that that, that idea of fatiguing to warning is something that we'll, we'll also come back to uh in the next section of the course where we talk about usability okay so in order to think about social engineering in a more formal way uh, what we'll do is we'll kind of break it down into, we'll break the attacks down into a kind of framework, okay? Um, and then we can think about all the different variations within a framework. So I read this book, uh, uh, Social Engineering uh, by Christopher Hegney, Hegnagy, sorry. Uh, and uh, this is linked to on Moodle and you can read it if you want to read it. Um, but but anyways, he, he presents a framework uh, in the textbook. I didn't quite like his framework. I felt like there, it was kind of, it included some extra stuff that, that weren't really necessary. And there was a whole bunch on like, I, I forget what he called it, like cognitive programming or something like that. And, and you know, I'm not an expert in that area, but, but based on what other, you know, the scientific literature was saying it, it seemed kind of like pseudoscience and things like that. So anyway, so I, I kind of went in and, and kind of stripped out the things that, that I thought were sort of controversial or, or, or not 100 percent like based in science. Uh, and uh, and but it still leaves you with a, a super useful framework. So it's a, it's a little simpler. Uh, it basically has three um, three categorizations and, and, and the third you can you can subcategorize. OK. So the first categorization is information gathering. So before you do a social engineering attack, you, you, you're targeting usually a specific person. Even if you don't know their name, you're, you're targeting them at some level, right? So like, for example, let's say you're pretending to be IT, uh, knowing that the company outsources the IT, what company they IT to, sorry, they outsource their IT to, uh, what an IT person looks like, you know, how they talk, that kind of thing. Um, that, that would all be part of an information gathering stage. Okay. Uh, the second part is the pretext. So pretext is just a fancy word for pretending to be someone that you're not. Okay. So that's a flavor that almost all social engineering attacks have. If they don't have that flavor, it's probably not social engineering. So the, not all social engineering attacks are going to have all, all of these things. Uh, but pretexting is sort of the def definitive feature of it being social engineering. So it's just you're pretending to be someone you're not. So you're saying I'm an IT person, but you're not actually an IT person. You're, you're someone that's attacking uh, the organization. And then the third thing is sort of what's your goal? What do you want to get out of it? And uh, so this is your influence. Uh, and you can subcategorize it, even though there's a lot of overlap between the two, into what I call or what it's called in the book uh, persuasion and elicitation. So persuasion is I want the victim to do something. So the attacker is trying to get them to open the door. Okay, so that would be persuasion. 
And then a variation on it is elicitation, which is you're trying to get information from the victim. So the attacker is trying to get the victim to disclose something that they're not supposed to disclose. Okay. And so the techniques that an attacker might use, there, there could be some difference between whether they're doing persuasion or elicitation, which is why we split them into subcategories. But there's, there's a lot of overlap as well. It doesn't, for a lot of things, it doesn't really matter whether I'm whether the attacker is trying to get information or if the attacker is trying to get you to do something. <coughs> okay, so I'm we're gonna I'm gonna show you an example. So this um, actually comes from so the author of this book uh, uh, did a TV series in in England. Uh, it might have been on the BBC or Channel Four. I forget where it is. Um, so they had this kind of like reality show where they would do some scams on people and it was supposed to, as real as reality tv is you know this was was real life scenarios and so they would actually go out and, and, and do this in real life uh they would have hidden cameras and capture it and then they would reveal uh what they did okay and so there's there's one example that he himself i think in the foreword to the book he he kind of holds up as a, a good example of of illustrating this kind of framework uh, in terms of thinking. Um, so the, uh, the example is, or the scam that they want to do is they basically want to find a victim. They want to steal their bank card. So that doesn't necessarily require social engineering, right? Like if someone's not, if they have their bank card in a bag and they're not looking at their bag and you walk by and grab their bag, then that's, that's fine. But where the social engineering really comes in is, in addition, they want to persuade the victim in order to reveal uh, their PIN. So like the four or six digit PIN uh, that protects the bank card. So once the attacker has the bank card and they also have the PIN, then they can they can start using the bank card or they could sell it off uh, to someone else that would, would use it. And we'll talk about the differences uh, there in, in, in a couple of stories you know, later in this lecture. OK, now. I'm going to pause for two reasons here. So the first reason is I want to pause and have you actually think about how you're going to do this, okay? And the condition is that you're not going to use coercion or violence or anything like that, okay? So um, the victim will actually be happy to reveal this information, willing to reveal this information. And furthermore, whether you can, you can try and achieve this or not, um, when the victim walks out of that situation, like when it's over, the attack is over, they actually don't know that they were attacked, at least not not right away, okay? So that that actually is, is a pretty hard attack to think of uh, trying to pull off. So just pause this video, hit the space bar, take take a minute or two or and, and, and just think, think about how you would do it. Uh, it, it's a little fun to, to, to try and think about these things first. And then when you watch the video, then you can you can think about how they actually did it. Okay, so hit the pause button now. <coughs> okay, so I'm going to say that you've unpaused the video now. Okay, so we're going to watch this video. Now, um, I'm going to try and do this one of two ways. This is an experiment. Uh, because I'm recording this and I'm putting it on YouTube, YouTube might decide that this content is in violation of copyright. It actually isn't because I'm using it for educational purposes, uh, but they have these automated tools and things like that. So um, I'm going to just try and play the video. I'm also hoping the audio routes through uh, to the video. Um, so I'm just going to try and play it and keep it as part of this video. Uh, but there's also a chance that, that I have to edit the video out, in which case you're going to see that, 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 that this video is going to end in a second. And then because it's on YouTube, I'll just put it as the next uh, video in the playlist. I'll put the link in the show notes as well.